So when we were um, when we were praying on Wednesday night, the Lord g- gave us some pretty good ideas. By the way, we still are doing that for those of you who don't come, which is pretty much all of you. You just like those little stabs? No. Um, no, it was awesome. We had a really good time, and the Lord uh, took us into conversation with one another that actually ended up being pretty insightful. And one of the things that, uh, how many of you notice that once in a while you can get walk through frustrations in life? Anyone? Anyone notice that when God is moving in you, that the, he's, there's stuff going on that's not always super peaceful? And there, you have to wrestle with things? Um, a lot of times, I think what people fail to realize is like, man, my life was really smooth, then I got saved and it got crazy. And the thing is, and even in churches that, uh, I'll be a little careful, well, no, I won't. Um, who cares? Uh, there's churches that say, I mean, a lot of churches don't actually allow the Holy Spirit to move even a little bit. I've been to a lot of them. I'm not naming ones, I'm just saying there's a lot out there. If you don't know that, just visit some. But there's a lot that don't allow the God to move at all, and it's pretty much everything that comes out of there. There's nothing of the kingdom or of the spirit of God because it's all man-made. The best of it is man-made wisdom. Um, and because of that, there's not a whole lot of attack coming against them because there's nothing happening. Does that make sense? Like, if you're not a threat, why would the enemy need to attack you? If you're steeped in religion and actually taking people away from Christ, even though you have a big picture of Christ on your wall, why would the enemy care to go after you if you're not actually taking ground? Does that make sense? And so a lot of times the spirit of religion is kind of like a, it's like, you know, having a whole bunch of dirt in a cup that's been there a really long time, but it's never stirred. So the water can actually look kind of clear, right? And like, oh, we don't have any problems going on here. But when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, he does not, he's not okay with that stuff being in our lives. He's not okay with unrighteousness mixing with righteousness. So he keeps stirring it up in us. He keeps showing us those things. He keeps shaking it up. And you're like, oh, gosh. And then you see, oh, oh man, this isn't so clear. There's actually a lot of dirt in here. And God's like, yeah, let me purify you. Let me take that stuff out. I'm stirring you up to show you what's going on. And he, I don't know if you guys have realized this, but the longer you've been a Christian, it's like he keeps peeling away those layers deeper and deeper and deeper. Amen? And it's a beautiful process, but it's not always easy for the amount of flesh that we still walk and creates the amount of conflict that goes on within us. Right? Like, because the more we die to the flesh, the more we can allow the Spirit to just come in and take and do what He wants to do. But the more flesh that we still hold on to, the more man-made ideologies, the more false religious ideas that maybe we've grasped as truth, thought they were truth, trusted in the person who gave those thoughts to us, but they're not actually of the kingdom. Sometimes those thoughts are the ones that are actually keeping us from the purification process that God wants us to walk in. That's some good stuff. I hope you're listening this morning. So anyways, there's, there's things, you know, and in the United States, we have a culture, correct? And that culture is something that gets into who we are, gets into our DNA, it gets into the church DNA a lot of the times, and we have to be careful of what we're allowing ourselves to be influenced by. You are in the world, but be not of it, right? And in that place, it's like we have to be careful, like, is this... American Christianity that I'm thinking right now? Or is this the kingdom? Is this Jesus? Is this really Jesus? Or is this the picture of Jesus that I painted and put on my wall for what I want him to look like? Because a lot of people serve a picture of Jesus and have never spoken to the man himself. A lot of religion, that's what religion is. It's putting something up there and saying, this is Jesus, we're worshiping it. It's actually an idol because it's not him. It's just a picture of him. Because he's when Jesus is a part of something, he's going to be speaking to you. I don't serve a deaf God. You know, one of the biggest, or a mute God, you know, one of the biggest things that God talked to the Israelites about with idols was 
hey, I'm not deaf, I'm not dumb, I speak, I can tell you what's going to happen. All these idols that you're worshiping don't speak, right? That's like the main thing he made clear was that I want to speak to you. So why does the church act like he doesn't? All right. I'm not even talking on that today. That's just free. So anything that is like trying to steal like the intimacy and the relationship and the reality of Jesus being present here and now and alive and active today and now is religion and it's garbage. And God is stirring us up. He's stirring you up right now in this time. Like, hey, do you want more of God? Every one of you should get out of your chair. That is the most general altar call of all time. Do you want more? Yes. Why wouldn't I? I'm a pastor, and I'm going to run for it every time on that altar call because I've tasted and seen that he's good, and I know I need more and more and more, right? As I eat of the kingdom, I'm more hungry in the kingdom. Like if you ever think, man, I've, I'm, I'm here. I'm exactly, I'm, I'm perfectly to the perfect place in my walk with the Lord, and I don't need anything else. How does that, how does that mindset work in marriage? Oops. I've arrived. I know this woman. <laughs> right? I mean, I, I, I've talked about that, that story before when we were at a marriage thing, and I actually heard the man say that about his wife. Everything I need to know, I've already figured out. And I'm like, you've been married how long? Four years. Mm, you're an idiot. Uh, their marriage lasted another six months. So if that tells you anything about that mindset, it doesn't work. You know, but it's not like we're supposed to be in this place. Like, even though I'm going after the more in God, it's not supposed, it's not like I'm supposed to be like disgusted in where I'm at now either. Does it make sense? Like, I'm, I love where I'm at now, but I also love where he's taking me. I love the process and I love where the process is taking me. Amen. I, it's this place of I've already been perfected by his love and his blood and now I'm walking out my sanctification. Amen. And I'm learning more and more how to hear his voice in different ways. I'm learning more and more about his um, subtleties, the subtleties of intimacy. And, you know, with our spouses, this is like, it's, you know, even if you aren't married and you just have a best friend, you learn more and more, you're growing intimate with your friends, right? It's a different kind of intimacy than between a man and a woman, but the intimacy that even friends have. You learn more and more about what your friends like, don't like, and, and when they say things, you know exactly what they mean behind it. It's like when Jesus said, why can't you understand my speech because you do not have my logos living inside of you? That's kind of what he's saying. He takes, says to the Pharisees, why can't you understand what I'm saying right now because you don't have my word abiding in you? And what he's saying, that lo word logos, is like, you don't know the me behind the speech. You don't know the me behind the speech. So, like, when my wife says something to me in a certain tone, I know the Christie behind that tone. So, therefore, it gives that speech definition to me. That's what Jesus is saying. When you're intimate with me, you'll understand. When you have my words and my teaching and you believe in me, when I'm abiding in you, then my speech will make more sense to you. Come on, church. That's good stuff right there. All right. So one of the things that we were, you know, thinking about with culture and stuff is we live in the most advanced, so some say advanced. I, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to go into that. Um, cultures, you know, and we're like, things are so easy, right, to us today. Can you imagine Abraham going to a supermarket? Right? Like, I have to go feed the sheep. I'm going to go buy sheep feed. I don't know. They eat grass, but... <laughs> you know, I remember watching this documentary, um, and they were bringing over these refugees from Africa, and they had, you know, they grew up pretty much in this desert country, and Everything was hard. They grew everything they ate, and they brought them over to the United States. And it's a funny, I can't remember the name of the documentary. It was a long time ago. But they, these guys walk in the grocery store, and they were just like, their jaws like hit the ground. 
They were like, it's the first time they'd ever seen a grocery store, and they could not believe how much produce and how much food. And they're like, the, the one thing that one guy said that I remember, he's like, they have a whole aisle for animals. Like he was shocked that they had hundreds of options to pick from for your dog and cat. It's like, this is crazy, right? So, like, we live in that place. So we have to realize that that kind of lifestyle will affect certain ways of how we live. And we live in a place where we are so entertained. I mean, I talked about this last, I think it was a couple weeks ago with Gladiator, right? Are you not entertained? Right? Like, we live, like, church is almost like a total entertainment place. And I think one of the reasons why Recalibrate is different is because we require something of you, right? It's different than just, I don't want you just to sit in your chair. I want you to get, get up and reach the world around you. I want you to reach your marriage. I want Jesus to reach your marriage. We're not okay with you staying the same if you come here. We are failing if you are the same today as you were six months ago. It's funny, it's like, yeah, come as you are and please change. Come as you are, please grow. Right? What kid in your home, if they acted the same way at six as they, you know, if they acted the same way, you know, if they were at the same maturity as they were six when they're 24, would you be like, mm, something not quite right here? Right? He's still crying when I took away his toy. Right? You, you, a six-year-old, they lose Spider-Man. They're crying, right? A 24-year-old, like, dude, get yourself up, you sissy. Right? Like, you'd be, like, why are you worried about that? Why do you have so much drama in your life based on those things? So if you have the same amount of drama in your life, well, I just felt like the stepping on toes right now. Um, like, if you're just as impacted, and uh, actually, this is a great way to know you need to grow. Like, when you react in a very childish way about something, it reveals a place you need to grow. Because we shouldn't be triggered by those things, right? In the same way. That's a place where Jesus should, it should be like, hey, you're acting like a six-year-old right now. Do you know why? Because there's a wounding from when you were six. And I want to come heal it so you stop acting like a six-year-old and you can be a true spiritual mother to those around you. Or a true spiritual father. <laughs> um, and trust me, I'm stepping, I'm like this up here, by the way. Stepping on my own toes. Because we're all growing together, amen? There are no superheroes in the kingdom I know the movies try to tell you there are, but just because someone's gifted and standing up behind a pulpit doesn't make them a superhero. They're going through the same struggles you guys are. And the world has shown us that a lot recently. And when we become separated and lonely, that's when we fall. All right. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is the thing about the kingdom of, in our culture is that we, are, we have these movies, we have these things, we see crazy stuff, we hear crazy things, we see all this crazy action on movies, and right? Like we're inundate, inundated with like the impossibility. I mean, we have movies about Godzilla and all this stupid stuff, right? That it's fun to watch because of the effects, right? But in and of that, I think sometimes we can get kind of, we're so, we see so much, we hear so much with the news from all over the world. Do you know that Abraham didn't have to learn about the news that was going on even 100 miles away? And we know about everything going on everywhere. Do you think our human minds needed to hold the weight of everybody's problems in the entire earth? All right, anyway, just a side note. But we hear about all these things, so, but there's a side of it like to where I think we can get desensitized to what God is doing in our midst now. And we get desensitized to the beautiful and crazy powerful things that he's doing right in front of us, and we don't even rejoice when we hear about them. Because we're so like numb, because our whole lives is... And we're getting pictures here and there and movies here and there and like news here and there and uh, iPods or whatever those 
podcasts here and there, and we're learning this and that, but we're not, like, is this making sense? And, you know, a couple weeks ago, we had, I don't think Caleb is here. Caleb shared his testimony. And I have to be honest, like, I was, I was super stoked at what God's doing in his life, right? I mean, someone who is, he shared his whole testimony, so obviously I can share it, uh, parts of it, but he was fully involved in crazy drugs, right, for a long time, going after those things, and God so wrecked, I mean, he even tried to cut his arm off because of some demonic encounter from drugs, And God came in and so wrecked his life that he's telling every person he sees right now about Jesus. Right? Like, and I get it. Like, there's a clap offering, right? But we we celebrate more when someone scores a touchdown. That means nothing. And I think there's a part of it, like, God wants to take us into a recycling process where he's like, hey, I need to show you again to teach you how to value what the kingdom values. To teach you how to, what to really be, what really has weightiness, what really has value to me. It's like, and I felt like in our prayer meeting the other night, God's like, I want you guys to celebrate what the kingdom celebrates. Do you know, like, when Jesus gave the analogy, when we even one person, right, when even one lost sheep comes in, comes back home, what does it say? It says, all of heaven parties rejoices. They they have a big party, like the prodigal son, right? When the prodigal son came home, they had a huge, the father ran out to meet him, and they have a huge party celebrating that. And so one of the things that hit me was like, like Bobby has an awesome testimony. Bobby, stand up. Right? Come on. Like, I want to celebrate what God's doing in your life. So we're going to have a party for you, okay? God said, let's have a party. I want to have a party. I want to have a party, a recalibrate, full-on party for Bobby and Caleb, okay? Because we're going to start celebrating when God does the miraculous in people's lives because it's the most amazing thing on the planet, amen? It's like when God changes someone and comes in and wrecks them with his love and all of a sudden they went from death to life, we should be rejoicing, Right? Like, it should, we should not just go, get up out of your chairs and celebrate, right? I'm not saying you have to do that now. I'm just saying, like, like, let's think. Like, just close your eyes. Just close your eyes for a second. I'm just going to let reality hit you a little bit. I want you to picture the worst picture of hell that you can picture. The worst picture of depression and loneliness you can picture. And we have people that were in those places. Bobby, look at me for a sec. Just you. You had a crazy life. It was rough. The enemy stole from you like crazy. And I remember the first time you walked through those doors, you said it felt like love punched you in the chest. (laughs) God just came in. So as you guys are sitting there, just picture someone that is going to that place. They're so depressed, they're cutting themselves. They're so depressed that they're, yeah, the enemy's attacking them. Just picture that, and then picture that person just getting, like picture the, Jesus coming down with his loving hands and just lifting them out of there and taking them to the most paradise type of place ever. And this isn't, we're not talking about a one-year thing. We're talking about eternity on this life and for the rest of their lives and for eternity, they get to live in that place. And what, how much should we party when God does that in someone's life? How much should we be grateful? How much should we treasure and value that process when God just comes in and wrecks us, wrecks somebody? Open your eyes. You guys hear in my heart? Like, man, I, 
I get focused. So, I mean, the more, the older I get, the more I'm like, God's like, hey, the more you stop focusing on your call and what you're supposed to do and start focusing on what's going on in your family and what's going on in everybody else, the more you're actually going to find true value of what the kingdom really is like. Amen? We're in a culture that is very selfish, and that's another thing about American culture. And even in church, it's crept in. I mean, I think most of my growing up years and doing mission stuff was, I mean, I don't know, a bunch of you have done these mission schools, but you get these prophetic words, and they're all about you. And you get these classes that are all about you, and know your call, and your purpose, and your thing. And then it's like, Jesus is like, hey, think about your neighbor, Right? You want to find value? Think about somebody else first, actually. You want to find true value? Lay down your dreams and try to get your wife's dreams to come true, and then you'll find life. This is how the kingdom works. Lay down what you want and just raise other people up and see what happens in your life. See if not, I, I don't open the floodgates of heaven in your life for what you have or what I have for you. Amen? I hope that's making sense. All right. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Round 2. I'm serious about the party, by the way. Bobby, we can talk to you about it later, but... I want to talk to you, meet with you, because we, we need to have a party. And that's another thing that Christians, that's one thing Christians don't know how to do. Party. We, <laughs> what? I, partying doesn't look like partying like the world. But we need to learn how to celebrate, amen? Come on. We need to learn how to celebrate, Amen? We need to learn how to be joyful. And a lot of times to learn true joy is when you take your eyes off of your own belly button and start looking out. Oh, okay. So, and be happy with what God's doing in someone else's life and see if you don't start getting filled with joy yourself. Amen? Because what he has done in somebody else, he will do in you and in others. He's done it over and over again. How many of you remember your encounter with Christ like it was yesterday? Right? Like those times that you, I mean, I, I can look through this room and see crazy stories everywhere. Of some of you that I know personally that had crazy encounters with God, that you were literally running from him, going the opposite direction, and you got 180'd by the Holy Spirit. I'm one of those people, and I like, I mean, Kiki, your story is a little crazy. That was sarcasm. Right? Scotty, you have a pretty crazy story. Right? I mean, how many of uh, my dad did? I did. I know a lot of you did. And it's and Jen and Lucas, man. 180'd. You guys were 180'd. A lot of you were 180'd, right? We need to celebrate that stuff because it's awesome. Hey, you know, I don't know a lot, but I know that I was like this, and now I'm like this. I don't know everything about Jesus, but I do know that I once was this way, and now I'm completely different. I once desired these things, and now I desire totally different things. Come on, church. And I'll, I'm actually going to talk kind of topically today. I know I don't normally do that, but I'm going to talk about freedom. And it's, you know, Independence Day, so it's kind of, you know. So the funny thing is, is I was thinking, I used to joke because me and my wife, we got married on July 4th, 4th, forch. Is that a porch and 4th? I don't know. Um, we got married on July 4th, and I will be honest, that was a dumb time to get married. Um, because everything we want to do is booked up. You want to go camping on the 4th? It's too bad. No spots open. Unless you plan a year in advance, which, if you know me, will never happen. And um, 
So anyways, it's just like, and then you're, you know, doing all these things. So I used to joke and say, you know, on Independence Day, I lost my independence. Um, you know, with the old ball and chain. <laughs> no. um, you know, that's how people look at it. And that is a worldly way to look at intimacy. And actually, the Lord was saying like, hey, I felt like he was just showing me in that little statement that I used. I mean, I just joked about it. I never said it seriously. Um, but I remember thinking, like, actually, it is in that that I gained, I actually got to know who I truly was. That giving away, like, who you are to somebody else, you actually get to know more about yourself. It's, it's kind of interesting. Anyone say amen to that? All right. So, yeah, we have, me and my wife have been married 16 years. Come on. She's not here today, so I should talk some trash. No, I'm just kidding. Um, she's awesome. She's getting ready for a party. All right, so where are we at here? Where did I say to go? Galatians 5? Go to 431 first. I want to talk about freedom today. Liberty, freedom. All right. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. We're children. And he's talking about the difference uh, with Abraham and Sarah, and they had Isaac, and they also had Ishmael. He's comparing Ish He's not saying literally. He's just using it as a spiritual example that there was one child born out of human uh, power, and there was one child born from God out of promise. And he's making the point that we were born not from human effort, but we were born from God's promise, amen, of the free woman. So next verse, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. And I talked with you guys a little bit. I was going through Galatians a couple weeks ago, and um, this was just really sticking out to me. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. And I started thinking about it because, you, you know, what is freedom? What is, what is true freedom? What is true liberty? You know, we have, you know, I think about the United States. Who do we honor for our freedom? Who? Soldiers. People who gave their lives for it. Right? Right? We honor the men and women that were willing to die so that we could live the way we live now. Like That sounds pretty scriptural, actually. The freedom that I have, I have because Christ died for me. And I honor him and what he did for me. And the, the, way I, the only way, reason I'm a son is because he died for me. The only reason I can walk in the power of righteousness is because he died for me. The only reason I can hear his voice and have him living inside of me is because he died for me. The only reason I can be called now the temple of the Holy Spirit and an ambassador for the kingdom of heaven and a citizen of heaven is because he died for me. Amen? And so someone, like even in our freedom in the world, people had to, they chose to die so that for the freedom that they believed in would come from the for the next generations. There is that future focus. And for the joy set before Jesus, he endured the cross, despising its shame, right? For the sons that would come home. And, and the thing about freedom, though, is that even in our nation, and I'm not going to go into all these details. There's obviously a lot to this. But Freedom has never been, the concept of freedom has never been do whatever you want. Right? It doesn't work in, it doesn't work in society. Because if my doing whatever I want actually causes harm or pain to somebody else and gets in the way of their freedom to live in the way that they want to live, right, then there's a problem. Right? So freedom doesn't mean I get to steal from people. Is that making sense? Like, so the idea and the concepts of freedom has is, is never been do whatever the heck you want. And actually, if you want to know the truth of that concept, that is Satanism. 
the whole mantra or whatever the, pro, I don't know, I can't call it a proverb because it's stupid, um, but the whole concept of Satanism literally is do what thou wilt. Whatever comes to your, like Satanists, if you study it at all, it's, it's, they're trying to encourage them, whatever, no matter how foul, no matter how vile, whatever crazy thing comes into your mind, just do it. Let go of everything and just do it. That is, that is, but that is, has, actually leads to bondage. It actually leads to slavery. It comes across as, hey, be free. And he does the same thing with people in the world. I remember like the battle going on in my mind when I was in church and like rebelling against God. The battle that came into my mind was, hey, they're trying to subdue you. I'm going to offer you true freedom and joy and peace and happiness, right? Do whatever you want. Stop following all this stuff and do whatever you want. Go have fun. And it's, there's no strings attached. Right? Yeah. There aren't strings. Just a big fat chain. Um, right? And it, it's like this concept. And so he does that in a lot of us. And he tries to stir up the flesh and create selfishness in us and get us to choose things that are selfish. And that the more selfish we get and the more, you know, the more in chains and in bondage we get and the further from the kingdom we get. And we think we're walking out freedom when we're actually slaves of sin. So what is freedom? What is freedom? What is liberty? You know, our forefathers of this nation said that that we should have life, liberty, and the what? Pursuit of happiness. Life, you have the right to life, the right to liberty, and the right of pursuit of happiness. But if my pursuit of happiness is stealing from you, then there's consequences, right? We all understand that, correct? And in the same way in God, how God does it, it's like the, tr- the truest form, the most pure form of liberty, the most crazy, I think the best definition of freedom is living according to your true identity. And your true identity is only found in Christ because he made you. It's only found in God because he made you. So the world can't tell you who you are. You can't tell you who you are. And that's the thing about like our society. They're preaching the opposite message and they're just throwing more chains on people. Whatever you think about yourself is who you are. Whatever you believe in your head is reality. And how is that working for people? Why are suicide rates so high? Doesn't sound like liberty to me. That doesn't sound like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to me. Amen? All right, so I want to look at this word. So it was for freedom that Christ set us free. And these words are very similar. Freedom is a noun in the Greek, and set us free, to make free, is a, the verb form of the, the one in the noun. So I'm going to read you guys. This is from a study book I have, so I don't know who wrote What's that guy's name? Spiros Zodiades? Yeah, that's why I didn't say it. He sounds like a smart guy. He just has this Greek word study book that uh, Lucas actually bought me, and I love it. It's really good. But here, he's, I'm just going to give you some, some notes here. So the word, it's eleutheria. And it's a noun. So it was for freedom that Christ set us free. So what I want you to notice here, it was for the purpose of freedom that Christ did what he did. That's what that's saying. It was for you to live in freedom for the reason he broke your chains so that you could never be in chains again. Right? He broke your yoke of slavery so that you would never be under the enemy's thumb again. He broke the chains of depression so that you would never go back to it. Once and forever done by the blood of Jesus Christ. Right? Like, so it was, we probably should know what he means by freedom. All right, here we go. Freedom is presented as a signal blessing of the economy of grace. 
So the econ- what's the, our economy? It's, what ma- it's like our whole nation and how it ticks. It's the wealth of our nation, right? It's the wealth of something. It's, it's, the, um, it's the products of something and the being able to, it's the natural resources of something. So when you think about the economy, the buying, selling, and trading of what you have and what you make, right? That's our economy. This is the wealth and the economy of grace, that we get to walk in the blessings of grace to its fullest extent. And grace, church, is the empowering presence of God for you to walk in your identity. I've shared that with you a bunch of times. Grace is God's unmerited favor on our lives, that it wasn't from our, us doing what we were trying to do. It wasn't from human uh, exercise or human... Um, Performance, it was all from God's grace, which is his goodness being coming to, to man and being made available to man through Christ. Amen? And so freedom is us actually walking in perfect grace. It's probably the simplest way. Walking in perfect grace. In the, walking with all of the empowering dunamis power of God in who he created us to be. It was represented as including independence from religious regulations and legal restrictions. You guys taking notes? By, if you are taking notes, I'm going to throw some things for you to study out there, okay? You can be Bereans on this. So the independence from religious regulations and legal restrictions, 1 Corinthians 10.29, 2 Corinthians 3.17, Galatians 2.4 and 2 Peter 2.19 are all good verses for that. Freedom from the yoke of the Mosaic law, which is what we just read about. In uh, Galatians 5.1, he was talking about, do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. And what he's talking about to the Galatians is they started going back to like circumcision and the, the law to try to make them righteous, right? And he's like, who has bewitched you guys? Why would you start out, you know, in the spirit and now go back to a yoke of religious regulations and slavery that didn't even work for the Jewish people? Why, Galatians, are you thinking that it's going to work for you now? Don't do it. Amen? All right, so freedom from the Mosaic law. It's freedom from the yoke of observances in general. (laughs) From the dominion of sinful appetites and passions. Freedom from the dominion of sinful appetites and passions. James 1.25 and James 2.12. It's freedom from a state of calamity and death. Romans 8.21. That we are free from ever fearing. Like if we walk... I'm not saying you guys are all walking in this right now, but what I am saying is when you walk in the economy of grace that the freedom that Christ paid for on the cross gives you, you know what I'm saying? When you walk in that empowering presence, you will not actually fear death ever again. So if you are fearing death, then ask the Lord to help you walk in more grace. (laughs) Come on, church. The freedom from a state of calamity and death. Freedom from fearing the future. I'm just adding this in. Because a lot of people, you might not be like, yeah, I know I'm going to heaven. But like, where, how many of us, I mean, how much of the news is trying to get us to fear the future? How much of the Christian news is trying to get us to fear the future? That is not kingdom. That doesn't come from God. You being afraid does the world no good. It does God no good. Thinking that the enemy is going to win is the stupidest thing to think. Thinking that the enemy is just like he has more power than God. And like when we accentuate who he is, we're literally saying that he's bigger. The problem is bigger than the answer. And what we focus on, we give power to in our lives, and then we wonder why we're not walking in the freedom that's available. Come on, church. Like, we have to learn to lift our eyes and see who God is, see what he is doing in the earth. There is is nothing, like, if there's one thing that he came to destroy, it was fear. 
Freedom destroys fear. The, like, so my liberty in Christ is so that I won't be afraid anymore. So that I won't be afraid of the future. I won't be afraid for my kids' lives. It's like we have so many justifications for why we fear. Right? So many. But, but look at this. But look at this. Maybe we should start saying, but God. But Jesus. But like, and that doesn't mean, church, what I'm not saying is that we're not going to go through hard things in our lives. What I'm not saying is that we're not going to be persecuted. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, like, when you are following who Christ is, that within those persecutions, you're still not afraid. There's a reason why Peter and James and Silas and Paul could be beat and thrown in prison and not fear. And instead, they had a worship service that led to a crazy breakthrough. Now, my question is, do you think they would have had that same breakthrough had they been going, oh, we're done for. Oh, God's not big enough. We're in a Roman prison. This is the end. Silas, this is the end. Silas, this is the end. <laughs> just you and me. Let's just, too bad we don't have shovels and a shotgun. We're, we're done for. Don't have 20 years stored up of food. Um, I'm done for. Um, what else are, I don't know, it's Y2K, I don't know, it's the year 2000, um, I don't think computers are going to be able to handle this crisis, so let's, right, like, you think about all of these things in Christianity, some of you are like, weren't even aware of that stuff, and it's like, my parents were taught not even to have kids because the end is coming, right, do you know how much worse off the world would be if they didn't have this person? I think more should clap. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding, actually, because I'm going to give Jesus what he paid for. And so are you. And so are my kids. It's like, I think Christians should be more excited today to have kids than ever before. And I think God is like what he's doing through our families and through the love of a true godly family. Like everywhere we go as a family, we wreck people. That's what I, I've actually, I was talking to Scotty, we were talking about this yesterday. Like, we went, we just went to a wedding, and people just saw us and our kids, and they just get touched. Like, I didn't want to have kids before, but after seeing you guys, I want kids now. I didn't even want to get married, but after seeing you guys, now I want to get married. Like, I've just noticed, it's like, man, this is what the world is crying out for. Like, and then Satan's trying to get us to grab hold of these little lies of fear and get us to walk in fear. And then he tries to use human religious truths behind it so we think it is even of God in some way. There is no fear in love. I'm not sure how much simpler we can put that one. There is how much? None. No fear in love. Where even when Paul, when a prophet comes to Paul, when Agabus comes to Paul, and he says, what does he say to him? Right? He tells him, he's like, he actually wraps himself in like a cloth or something. I can't remember exactly what he wrapped. What was it? A garment or something? A belt. Yeah, there we go. A belt. And he's like, you know, this person, like, he literally just tells Paul, hey, if you go, you're going to, back to Jerusalem, you're going to be in chains. Paul's like, yeah, I know. Pretty much what he tells him. I know, God showed me. He showed me what I have to suffer for him, and it's an honor. That's a man without fear. That's a man walking in the economy of grace in his true identity in Jesus Christ. Did you know, here's another thing, I'm going to add this. I'm going to touch on this because this is what I felt the Lord said as well. He, he said also, do you know that freedom is freedom from all insecurity? My freedom is actually, it's a freedom, it's a liberty of insecurity. Man, that would be cool. Because I know, when I look in this room, I know that none of you are walking in perfect security at this point in your lives. Some more than others, 
I'm going to not look at you just so you don't think I'm picking you out. It's funny because when I'm talking, some people are like, you were talking right at me. I'm like, no, I was just kind of scanning, but... You know, but it's the Holy Spirit that's talking at you, not me. But right, like, he is a freedom from insecurities in all ways, shape, or forms. I have way too many insecurities. How many of you would say amen to that? Like, I have way too many. I allow the enemy to get in and say you're not enough way too much, and I agree with him. And Jesus is like, well, there's kind of true. You're not enough, but then there's me in you. So therefore, you're more than enough. Right? And it's like, as soon as, you, as soon as you actually grab hold of the argument, I'm not enough, you actually exclude Christ from your life, and that's why you're not. Maybe I should talk to this person. No, um, right? This is making sense. All of the insecurities, like even the things that God lays on your heart, and then, right, like you get this encounter with the Lord, he lays things on your heart, and then what's the voice you hear right after that, like the next day? You're not going to make it. That's never going to happen. You're too stupid. You're not enough. You don't have enough education to do that. Right? Whatever it is. You don't have the finances to do that. And all of that is excluding Christ from the scenario. Amen? We are supposed to be free of fear. We are supposed to be free of insecurities. Christ's perfect identity in us gets rid of insecurities. And it's not, doesn't create pride in us. It creates, I know who I am. Amen? It was for freedom that Christ has set you free. All right. Let's keep reading. In contrast with the present subjection of the creature to bondage of corruption, he's talking about that creation was subject to the bondage of slavery, right? Because of sin. Freedom represents the future state of the children of God. The perfect law of liberty or freedom in James 1.25 is the freedom of generosity, especially in James 2.12, when the judge shows his generosity in proportion to the mercifulness of the believers on earth. And the idea of spiritual freedom is not near as strong in the Old Testament as it is in the New. And there's a verse that talks about in Scripture um, where Paul talks in Galatians chapter 4. Actually, let's just turn there because we're in Galatians 5. Um, hold on, let me move that. You guys doing okay? All right. Um, just go to Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, I believe is what it is in my memory. Yeah. But when the fullness of time came, when he says when the fullness of time came, he's talking about Jesus, when God set Jesus and Jesus died and rose again from uh, the death from the dead and ascended into heaven. This is the fullness of time came because that's when the covenant of Jesus was established with us. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that he might receive, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And that's a big statement. The Abba Father is literally like the, the Jews of the day would not, they were really angry at Jesus for using the term Abba. Because it was like saying daddy. It's like this term of it. It wasn't, it wasn't they didn't view it as being honoring enough to how, who God was. Is that making sense? And here he's, he uses that, Paul uses that again to describe like God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave. I think this is where that one song was written. I'm no longer, right, a slave. You are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And if a son, this is why it says we're sons. This is why it doesn't say we're daughters. 
Because in their culture, sons got the inheritance. And it also, he's not talking about our gender. He's talking about our position. In the same way, he says the church is the bride of Christ. He's not talking about our gender. He's talking about our position in relationship with him. And our position for every man and woman in this room, our position before Daddy God is a son because I get all that he has. I get, I'm an heir to the inheritance of the economy of grace. I'm an heir to the inheritance of his empowering presence to transform me into who he wants me to become, who he created me to become. Amen? And I think we're constantly trying to figure that out because the world, we're so like inundated with different things that there's all these little pieces of the world in our identity and God's just like, no, nah, that wasn't me. Nope, that's not me. Oh, that's not me. How many of you, this is hitting home, right? Like how much, how we think, it was, does God constantly, this is what I'm talking about, like shaking that up. Always, like we go through seasons where we're like, I think I'm doing pretty good for a while. And then he's like, getting shook up and we're like oh yeah that's not of him I'm gonna get rid of that one now and get rid of this one now and it's like and then there's seasons where we really trust in God and then we we start letting you know we might trust in God in a certain way and be really strong in a certain area and then another season we actually become enslaved again to the yoke of slavery of that fear again And we need someone like Paul to come to us and say, hey, don't do that. (laughs) Stop it. Stop going back there. Stop letting go of your identity as sons and heirs. Stop thinking that you're ever without God. Stop thinking that he's ever even angry with you. Stop thinking these thoughts, right? Stop thinking that you have to perform for his love. Remember when you came to him, you knew that you didn't have to because his love just poured out so blatantly on you. And now you, were, you identified as a prodigal son and you were all stoked with that. But now you're identifying as the older son and you think your performance is now going to get you there. Come back to the economy of grace. And... This is one thing. Go back to Galatians 5 where he says, "Standing, therefore keep standing firm. These, the words in the Greek here are pretty awesome. It's like, he's like, don't be enslaved again. Don't be entrapped. Don't, it's like a snare. Don't be ensnared again. Don't allow the trickery of the world or the devil to ensnare you again to this stuff. Don't allow the trickery of religion or false belief systems to ensnare you into these things. Don't be a, ever be to the yoke of slavery. Every place that you have an insecurity in your life reveals a place of a yoke of slavery that has a right in your life because of a false belief that you have about yourself. Every insecurity that you have about yourself, everything you struggle with about yourself is the biggest thing is it's it's lacking Jesus in that place. That's simple. It's lacking Christ in that place. I can't do this. Who said you, who said you can't? I'll never be this. Who, who said that? Who said you'll never be what I've called you to be? Who told you? Does that sound familiar? Who told you that? Who told you that? Who are you listening to? Every sin I've ever struggled with is based in a false identity. Every sin you've struggled with is based in a false identity. Do you... uh, Go to Luke 4. I'm going to try to wrap this up. I could talk about this for... I mean, this is awesome, but... is, Is it making sense to you guys? Go to Luke 4, and then go to, keep your finger there, and then go to John 8. Am I boring, you guys? All right. 
The reason I was talking about the sons verse in Galatians 4 is because in the Old Testament, they kind of view it as an age of childhood where we were God's children, but we were like little kids. And so we needed, when you're a little kid, you don't, the, uh, Jesus even says you don't look much different than a slave, right? Because you don't have the rights to make your own decisions yet, and you're, you're guided by tutors and teachers, and he called the law the tutor age, to where we were like little kids having a tutor. But that tutor led us to adoption as sons in Christ, because the law showed us our need for Christ. Amen? And then when we found out that we needed Christ and we accepted Christ, we came into the age of adult sons. And the word in the Greek where he says, therefore you are now sons, is a a mature adult son. Kind of like the son that that Jesus even gives the thing of when the prodigal son comes home, what does he give him? He gives him a ring of authority from the father. And so it ceases to be, hey, I'm a little kid under a tutor and like I'm, and I've grown up and matured, and now I'm walking in Christ, and Christ is walking in me. Therefore, I get to live in my identity as a mature son of God and walk in the authority of the kingdom. To when I go into town and say, hey, my dad wants to do this business. They're like, okay, he has the ring. Okay. And the spirit of religion in the church hates this concept. (laughs) And they're trying to get you to go again to a yoke of slavery to become like little kids again. I'm going to stop there. Okay. I just like throwing things out there because you guys should just research them. It's good. Um, So I told you Luke 4 and what else? John 8. All right. Okay. Go to verse. Uh, sorry, I went too far. Thirty-one. John eight. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, "If you continue in my word, then you are truly." disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Continue in my word. I think it's funny because a lot of times in church, we only read verse 32. Continue in my word. Continue in the economy of my words. It's kind of a thing about logos is it's such an impactful word to me. I love that word because it means a lot more than our English word for word. It's like continue in the thought process of my kingdom and then you will truly be my disciples and you will know the truth when you continue in my word and the truth of my word will make you free. The truth of who I say you are in the economy of grace will make you free. The truth of looking at yourself through what I'm going to pay for you will make you free. The truth of me living inside of you will make you free. Will help you live in that economy of grace that my blood provided for you. Now, let's keep reading. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And this is part, like this is one of the verses to stand on when you're feeling like God or Satan is trying to entrap you again or get you to doubt anything. Jesus is literally saying here, I've made you free. I'm the son. You are sons forever. And there is nothing that can get in the way of that. You were a slave of sin, and you were someone, like I think he's even referring to the old covenant here, a slave does not remain in the house forever. You get to come in and serve God, but you don't get to live and abide in him. Is that making sense? Before you were a slave before you were a servant, and in the, in the Old Testament, that's usually how they refer to us and God, our relationship. It was all about obedience. Is obedience important? 
Yeah, it's really important. What is the one thing as a parent you're really trying to teach little kids, your little kids? You need to learn to listen, right? And as they learn, you need to hear my heart and not just obey out of the fear of, the, of daddy, but obey because you know that daddy loves you so much and everything I want for you is way better than what you want for yourself. And then I'm wiser than you, little one. And that I can see a lot further into the future than you can. And the reason I'm dealing with your little things now is so that it doesn't cause way more pain to you in the future because these, ac these wrong activities now will destroy you in the future. But then as they grow up, they get to a place where they start knowing your heart. They start knowing the why behind the fear of the Lord. <laughs> And you start to walk in the love of the Lord. Not that you completely disregard the fear of the Lord. You've just walked into a much higher place of relationship. Is that making sense? A much higher place of understanding. And he comes in your lives and he starts changing you from the inside out. He frees you from all of those false things to where you can walk in your sonship. And he releases you as an adult son to carry his kingdom, to be an ambassador for his kingdom in the world you are living in now. And to be empowered with his power to change the world around you. Now turn over to John chapter 7. I know I'm giving you guys a lot. I always do, but... Twenty nine, verse twenty nine of John chapter seven. Jesus says, I know him. He's talking about the Father. I know him because I am from him and he sent me. I know God because I know my Father because I'm from him. And he sent me. Now go to Luke chapter four, where you were at. I'm gonna end with this. Hopefully you guys are still with me. Luke chapter 4 is the temptation. He was led, Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, Luke 4 says. So the Holy Spirit was leading him into a place of testing. He knew that the devil was going to test him. Did the Holy Spirit test him or did the devil test him? The devil did. So the Holy Spirit is not tempt. He just was leading Jesus in because he knew that this, this testing was going to lead to something great. And he knows that when things get tested, when we're tried, when we go through hard situations, I mean, this is something to think about, church, but I was talking about this with somebody the other week, a couple pastor friends of mine. I was talking to them. I'm like, I, I said something along the lines of, I don't know if I've ever grown in my entire life without going through something hard. Like I think about the seasons, like the seasons that everything is going good, and it's not like that was a bad thing, and I enjoyed them, but I, when I think about the times of my life when I've grown the most, it's going through something tough. It's wrestling with things. And then, like, even when we have those high encounters with Christ, like, how many of you have had really cool encounters? Oh, uh, well, I, like a crazy encounter with the Lord, right? Like where he comes and it's like, I, I still remember when I went to Brownsville and I thought like being slain in the spirit was garbage and it wasn't real. And I walked up front and God just like fully laid me out. Right? I just walked up front. No one even touched me. And the guy's just like, more Lord, more Lord, more Lord. And I'm like, Phew. and God just like, but then God spoke to me in that time. And the thing is, did I grow in that experience? Actually, I don't know that I did. I grew in that experience because I stewarded what was given to me in the experience. So it's not like you still have to steward what he gives you. And I think we live in a culture where we're learning so many things. We get, sometimes we get so many prophetic words, and have we stewarded any of them? 
or when you're in here and we lead you through an encounter and you hear who you are in God, you hear God's voice say, this is your name. I think of Patty. I don't know if Patty's here today, but I remember when she had an encounter and, and she got the name. Yeah, so you guys remember too. She got the name, I'm, I am victory, right? That doesn't actually, it, it, it changes you to a place, but then you have to, to really grow in it. You then have to steward the name. Does that make sense? And so there's a lot of us, and we're like, well, you know, we, we get disenfranchised with the things of God, and, and I've been in this season myself. Like, when you get disenfranchised with these prophetic words or these prophetic words, like, I don't want to hear another word that you're going to, uh, another word from anyone that I'm going to change the world. Has anyone ever been there? Right? Like, if anyone tells me, oh, God has this huge thing for you, I'm going to be like, dude, shut up. Sorry. I mean, some of you are like, oh, God. I just, like, inside, I'm like, I'm tired of hearing those words at times. And I, there's, like, you get struggling. Like, well, how much of that word is actually mixed with American theology? To be important, you have to be big. Right? To be valuable in the kingdom, you have to be touching millions of people's lives. When Jesus rose from the dead, he only had 120 people waiting for him. I'd say he had some value. Anyway, I'm not saying that the people that give those words, because I've given people those words, some. I'm not saying that they're wrong or anything like that. I'm just saying like there's a, at a point in time you're like, I just want to hear from my father who I am and walk that out. So what does he call you? What has he called you? And if you're not walking in that identity, you won't be walking in freedom because freedom is walking in your identity. And I'm not going to read this whole chapter because it's going to, it would take a little too long, but I'm just going to reiterate a few things. So when he gets tempted, what is the thing that Satan says to him? He says, if you are the son of God, right? He, and we've all heard these, I'm sure most of you have heard this teaching, but right before this had happened, what happened? He got baptized and a voice came out of heaven, which I would love this to happen to me. It's never happened to me yet, but I don't need it to happen because it tells me right in here that I'm a son. But it would still be cool. Well, a voice comes out of heaven, and everybody around Jesus heard it. Jesus heard it. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Right? This is my son. And so he gets led into the wilderness. What's the first thing the devil says? If you're the son. And here's the thing. The devil works in insecurity. This is why insecurity is such a big deal, guys. It's because every time, if he can get you to be insecure about anything, your insecurity reveals a belief in a false identity. Does that make sense? And the thing that stuck out to me when I was reading this the most is like, not only does he question it, but then the thing that God's been speaking to me the most is what does Satan say after it? Prove it. Prove it. This is how the enemy works. Did God really say you're supposed to have a son? Prove it. Go get Hagar. Prove it. Prove it that you can have a son. Human effort. Prove it. Prove what God said about you. Turn these if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread, right? If you're the son of God, throw yourself off these cliffs because God says in his word that he'll do this. So that one is not like, hey, you prove it, but try to make God prove it. Right? Like there's always the spirit of performance behind. And it's like, the thing is, as soon as you actually grab a hold, even a little bit of that lie that I have to prove it, you're actually already walking in the lie. Is that making sense? You've stepped into the lie, therefore you've stepped out of the economy of grace and into the economy of the devil. And you have no power there. 
Jesus didn't have to prove it because his father said it. And he stayed in his identity because he didn't try to prove who he was. He just walked in who he was. Right? I only, I only do what I see my father doing. Who are you talking to me right now? I don't have to prove anything to you. Come on, church, this is powerful. Jesus walked without sin because he walked in his identity all the time. Jesus was perfect and pure and walked in his identity in a, like, he never allowed the yoke of slavery to come into his life. And I'm telling you guys, I, I feel this because I'm like, I feel like God is beckoning me in this. He's like, stop going again to the yoke of slavery. Stop doubting what I call you. Stop allowing false things and false value systems of the world to say you're not valuable or what I'm doing in you isn't valuable or who you are isn't valuable. Stop it. <laughs> Stop. Just listen to my voice. Who is saying those things? Like, I think about, I've even, can you, am I boring you guys? Are we doing okay? You guys are really quiet. I mean, I just, I, was, I think, I, I'm glad you're listening. I'm just, sometimes when people are really quiet, I'm like, are they, they're like, dude, shut up. I need a steak. <laughs> All I'm saying is, actually, a lot, just the main thing, like, I just feel God, like, there, I just know that there's so, I know me, there's so many pullings about the value system. Like, I feel like the devil is constantly just trying to get me to believe even for a second, like, all the time, like, he works on me, he was, like, trying to steal my value, so I'm guessing he does that with you, too. Like, and I feel like when I go into a place with the Holy Spirit or start speaking in tongues, and this is where the gift of tongues is really good, because when you're in that place thinking or thinking like, am I this, or you're questioning things, like just start speaking in tongues. I'm just telling you. Just try it. Start speaking in tongues and see what starts happening. See, see what your mind starts actually thinking about after that. Because every time it's like, I mean, the enemy, will, he will twist, he will even twist my sermon, other people's sermons to try to steal your value. I'll try to take one thing and put it out of context and say, oh, see, he was talking to you about this. This is why you suck. Right? That is not the voice of the Father. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are my beloved son, and I am well pleased with you. Walk in your identity and you will walk in the freedom of the economy of my grace. Every insecurity is a place of a lie. Every false value system, every place you feel like I'm a failure in, God's like, how can you be a failure? I've already won. You, like, and I, I even think about this, like, look at what the world's trying to devalue. What are they, they, they're devaluing family, probably more than just about anything. Like, we value success in such a way of, like, and I was thinking about this, and I'm just going to share with you guys a little bit about some of my thought processes. Think about being a famous pastor or a, Right? Like, let's say you're, let's keep it in the religious sector. Let's say that all of a sudden things break open wide f for me, we'll say, uh, in a worldly sense. And let's say I get to start preaching to stadiums of people, like uh, Billy Graham, we'll say. Have you seen Billy, uh, Billy Graham's videos? And I'm not saying, like, I'm not saying anything against that. I'm just saying, at the heart of it, Let's say, there, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of people that he spoke to. And I just, I feel like God is taking me through this process because I'm thinking about it and I'm like, oh, you, know, you know how many times he heard from people how awesome he was from them? 
I was actually watching a um, documentary last night, um, kind of, it was on Celine Dion. I'm a huge Celine Dion fan. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> My wife really likes Celine Dion. That's why we were watching it. But, it, I mean, she does have an incredible voice and an incredible gifting, but she's like really struggling right now. And her whole goal is just to try to get better enough to get back on that stage. And I'm like, that is what a false identity will do. My value is in my gifting. My value is in my, like, and I just think about someone like Billy Graham or like say I was doing those things. It's like, do you, like, I'm just thinking like the weightiness, like, let's say, Ezra, you don't know me. You come up and be like, that was so powerful. You're so awesome. I'm like, it actually holds no weight. He doesn't know me. Right? Like, how much do we want to be recognized by these people or do we want to be recognized by the world around us when it means nothing because they don't know you? Right? Like, it's all vanity. It's all fake. Like, the whole thing, I think about, like, if my wife doesn't look at my life and think I'm a man of God, then I'm not. Right? Then I'm not. Who cares if Robert from Canada thinks you're awesome? Right? Sorry if Robert, if there's Robert from Canada, I'm not talking about you. Like, if... I'm just putting myself, like, what we value, I, it's just got to shift. Because I actually think when we value what's truly valuable, we'll actually have a way greater impact on the world around us, actually. Is that making sense? Like a deeper impact. Like, I don't need 12 million people to say yes to Christ. I need a couple Peter, James, and Johns. Right? Like, like Jesus style. What if all of you helped raise up just a Peter, James, and John who were your best friends. Just throwing it out there. It's like, and I think about like, who cares how other people view you when they don't have that walk with you? What care, like what matters, what has true value is when your friends know you and, and be like, man, I'm just, I respect you so much in the walk that you're walking. Right? When your kids look at you and say, I want to follow Jesus because of how you follow him at home. You think they care how good I am here? And I just think I'm in a midlife, I'm going to say a midlife uh, reconstruction. I'm not going to say crisis because I'm not in a crisis, but I'm in a place as I, I feel like as I'm getting older that God is just like, what's truly valuable? When I stand before him at the throne, all of the vanity, it will be like, and you'll be left with who you truly are and whose you truly are. Stand up with me. How many of you want to walk in true freedom? Freedom from, just put your hand on your heart. And, and just say, I am a son. And as a son, God has given me the right through his economy of grace to walk in freedom. I am free of fear. I am free of insecurity. I am free of sin. And anything else that brings separation between me and my Abba. I am free to be. In the name of Jesus, let sonship come in a new way this day. Let the value of the kingdom be implanted in our hearts.
You are free indeed. You are free indeed. If Jesus has set you free, then you are free indeed. And you remain in the house of the Lord forever. You are seated with him in heavenly places. And your seat is never going to be taken by somebody else. There's not musical chairs in heaven. You get a seat. Jesus doesn't care how much you make. He cares how much you love. Thank you, Lord. Let us be authentic lovers of you. Man, we want to walk in your economy of grace, Lord. We want to walk in the empowering presence of God. So we say today, let us not walk again and be under the yoke of slavery of religion. Amen? Amen. Let us not listen again to the voice of insecurity. Amen? Amen. I only listen to my father. <sighs> Jesus, I'm sorry for listening to so many other voices. We choose to listen to you and give honor to your voice in our lives. Man, I think, I just I sense right now that God is kind of like blowing some of your minds up right now with what he has for you. When you start saying, whatever you want, Lord, <laughs> buckle up. It's awesome. So Jesus, we thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for what you are doing in the, this very house right now. I thank you for my phone going off right at that crucial moment. <laughs> Lord, I thank you for speaking to our hearts right now. I thank you for your presence always being with us. So Holy Spirit, would you just come and begin to release identity in the way that only you know how, in a new way right now. So as you're sitting there, just say, who am I, Lord? I know there's times for me where I have to lay every prophetic word I've ever gotten, just lay it down. Say, who do you say that I am, Jesus? Father, who do you say that I am? Is there anything more valuable than being a father, being a mother? Being a son? The kingdom is simple. presence is just here right now, so just enjoy it. I see the Father hugging all of you. I feel like someone has something specific that the Lord laid on your heart to do. Is 
or anyone in here with a word or you felt like a direction? Is it you? <laughs> I figured. Come on. Um, yeah, you can just stay in that quiet place. Um, just kept hearing the words uh, like simplify, simplify, simplify. Um, there's a lot of minds that are really active and the what do I do? And God, I want more. And um, there's a simplification. He wants to bring peace to that. Um, I just heard just, just, there's a really simple just being, just like smooth waters. So I just release that in Jesus' name. Questions, everything I do is just to be quiet, be still, and know. Just be still and know who He is and who you are. I just see really, really smooth waters, smooth. And that's what He's releasing into your spirits right now. heard this word that your greatest breakthroughs are going to come out of rest and so you can set that striving aside because he is your breakthrough thank you Lord we release that in Jesus name we bless your spirits to receive that Jesus, would you meet me on this smooth water? And he's going to meet each of you. I want you to fix your eyes on him and just see what he says to you, see what he speaks into your spirit. the clarity 
in your minds right now to hear him. So clear to see and hear and feel a release, a, a grace of clarity, crystal, like just precise, laser precision. Just have the front open if you want to come up. We're going to just conclude the service this morning. If you want to stay in this place, we're just be here as long as you need. If you want to come up, uh, me or the leadership team will be praying for people up front. And uh, if you need to head out, just feel free to head out. Bless you guys. Walk in your identities. Amen. Not this week, forever. All right, love you guys.